We will be starting this evening in Isaiah chapter 31. We're moving right along. And in about 40 or 45 years, we'll get through with the book. <laughs> That's the important thing. I have verses 1 through 3 titled as a warning against an alliance with Egypt. And as you begin verse 1, woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Homer Haley pointed out, The problem of Judah's disposition to rely on Egypt was so acute as to necessitate repeated prophecies against the sin. Chapter 31 appears to be an advance beyond chapter 30, but it deals essentially with the same problem. Whereas chapter 30 emphasizes Judah's disposition to leave God out of their plans and to act on their own, chapter 31 emphasizes that God's wisdom is superior to that of the, of the politicians who made such plans and to that of the Egyptians whose military expertise and power they sought. Also, God's fierce providence and tender care toward his people are set uh, are set aside or are, are set side by side in this chapter. Jehovah will judge and destroy Assyria without aid from Egypt. We all know of sins that are of such nature that people you can warn them over and over and over and over and they still go back to it, and they still do it. That's what you're seeing in relationship to Israel with, G with Egypt, or Judah with Egypt. Uh, they continue to seek Egypt's help. Uh, this same warning had been given, uh, as Brother Haley had mentioned, uh, in chapter 30, if you look at the first two verses of chapter 30, when he says, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, that walk to go down to Egypt, and ask not at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Essentially, what we have in this verse is the same thing that you saw at the start of chapter 30. Uh, you know, the first three laws of learning, what are they? Well, it's repetition, not really. Repetition. Repetition, repetition. Um, and so you're seeing that with uh, Isaiah as he's trying to teach his, or Judah, you know, don't rely on them. Don't put your trust in them. Absolutely, why we need to be a Bible study every time. Uh, and not simply rely upon what the public teaching is, but to study the Bible at home. Uh, I remember several years ago, this is when I was, could have been considered then a, a young preacher. Uh, I'm trying to remember how many decades ago that was in which I was talking about the need, you know, 
daily Bible studies and you know, within the home, uh, dev daily devotional. And I was told, well, people, you can't expect people to do that anymore. We're too busy. We got too much activity. And <laughs> it's a whole lot worse than that now as far as those things. But, and I'm, I'm thinking that was in the late 1970s, mid to 1970s. That's how, uh, how long ago that was. That's why I say I, could, I was a young preacher then. And I didn't know any better that, you know, you can't expect people to do that today. Uh, sad. Uh, but that's, that's the thinking of people. Uh, wonder, you know, these parents that have children growing up, how many of them have daily Bible study with them? Or daily devotional? Uh, or is it, they can't expect that today, it's, we're too busy. <laughs> well, a, a lot of times they'll do the public school work, but they won't do the anything religiously. Uh, they don't even do the, their homework anymore. That's true to a great extent. Uh, but here's this warning over and over, and they continue to do it. Uh, The last figures that I have were, are from several years ago, and at that time it still was selling at about 25 million copies a year, I believe is what it was. But as I say, that was five, maybe 10 years ago when I last looked. But, yeah, that's, that's the thing now. We've got the Bible online and don't need to buy a physical Bible. Uh, I, to put it one way, I haven't touched a physical Bible in years, except that one up there when I'm making a point. Uh, because everything is online. Uh, all of my study, all of my work, all of my Bible reading is done online. So, and through my Bible, pro through my Bible program. Um, but the question never was how many were sold. The question really was how many were read and studied. The warning had also been given that Israel or not, Egypt would be destroyed. Uh, someone turn over to Isaiah chapter 20 and read verses 2 through verse 6. Isaiah 20 verses 2 through 6.
say in that day, Behold, such is our expectation, whether we plead for help to be delivered from the king of Israel, or how shall we escape? In other words, Assyria is going to carry away Egypt <laughs> and in the captivity. So the warning had been given, and Isaiah walking around for three years uh, naked. Now then, naked is not totally without clothing as we studied at that time. Uh, it is probably in that situation without the outer, outer garment. He still would have had on the inner garments, but um, and barefoot and walking three years is to show Israel Egypt's going to be destroyed. And this is the way that they're going to be carried away. Uh, so the warning, don't go to Egypt. The warning, Egypt's going to be destroyed. Both of them had been given already. But the Israelites were infatuated with Egypt. <laughs> I mean, they had an infatuation with them, a, a love affair with them that Isaiah just couldn't get through to them. Uh, and they were going to rely upon Egypt despite e Egypt's failures. Uh, and despite the help of uh, their failure to give help, and of course the coming destruction that Isaiah had already prophesied concerning. They had already sent ambassadors down to Egypt, and both Leopold and Young point out that this had been done repeatedly. So it wasn't just send an ambassador, and then that was it. They continued to send ambassadors to them. Um, you know, you would think after the first, second, or third time, you might learn something, but they didn't. Um, they wanted Egypt's help against Assyria, and that was, in their mind, the only way in which they were going to gain help and gain uh, independence from Assyria was by Egypt. The Jewish leaders thus were pitting their wisdom against God's wisdom as to how to deal with Assyria. God had basically said, trust in me, Rely on me, be obedient to my word, and I'll deliver you. Their wisdom says, we need Egypt. And we need their horsemen and their chariots and all of that. So here you have the wisdom of God versus the wisdom of man. And they were going to do the wisdom of man because that's what they wanted to do. Uh, we basically do what we want to do. Uh, secular history uh, notes the vast number of horses in Egypt. So what Egypt could supply, which was military might, uh, is what Judah believed in instead of believing in God. And that military might gave the Israelites a false sense of security. Concerning the chariots, trust in chariots, because they are many. Pulpit, pulpit commentary notes, the lor, large number of chariots maintained by the pharaohs is abundantly evidenced. Diodorus, a, who is a historian, he assigns two Sesostris, that's one of the pharaohs, 27,000. 
That is, no doubt, he says, or they say, an, an exaggeration. But the 600 of the Pharaoh of the Exodus, and even the 1,200 of Shishak in 2 Chronicles 12, 3, are moderate computations, quite in accord with the monuments and with all that we otherwise know of Egyptian warfare. Egypt exported chariots to their neighboring countries, according to 1 Kings 10, 29, and was at this time the only power which seemed capable of furnishing ch such chariot force as could hope to contend on a, to on a tolerable even terms with the force of Assyria. That's a large number no matter which one of these figures you get, that's an awful lot of chariots, isn't it? If what uh, Deodora, Deodorus says, 27,000 chariots, can you imagine that number? Um, even if you don't accept that, which Pope Commentary says, has to be an exaggeration. Uh, you still have the 600 during the time of the Exodus. You have 1,200 during Shishak's time. So, huge number of chariots uh, to send, and they supplied them to other nations. They were a powerful nation and thus in Judah's mind the leader's mind the only way we can deal with Assyria get Egypt help Egypt's help get the chariots from them uh, get the horsemen from them when in reality the only one that could have given them help was God. God was the only one that would have been able to deliver them. It doesn't matter how many chariots Egypt could have or would have supplied to them. Unless they relied on God, they were still going to fall. but they would not seek him. And as we see back in the previous chapter, if you look at chapter 30, and look at verse 10 and 11, where he says, Which say to the seers, See not. And to the prophets, Prophesy not unto us right things, Speak unto us smooth things, Prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way, Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Basically what they're saying is, God, we don't want you interfering with our plans. Get out of the way. Get your prophets out of here. We don't want to hear them. All we want to hear is good things, how that Egypt's going to deliver us. So God, you get out of the way. And that's their attitude. You could say, isn't that the attitude of so many people today? Uh, couldn't you say that the prevailing attitude of our society is, I'm going to do what I want to do no matter what. I'm going to live the type of life that I want to live. Doesn't matter what anyone says, doesn't matter what God says, I'm going to do my thing. Isn't that the prevailing attitude of our society? Ain't much difference in 2125 or judges. And that there is no king in, the, in Israel, that's everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. And that's true. Uh, that, that in reality is the, is the major fight of 
all times, through all societies, uh, whether we follow God's way or we do things our way. And more often than not, that which wins out is our way. Okay, Dale. Dale. Yeah, that's what I was just saying, that, and that's the case. People want to do what they want to do, and they will do it. And that's why you see Jesus saying that the majority are going to go into the way of destruction, while the few are going to be going that straight path to eternal life. Why? Because very simply, they're the majority of people are going to do what they want to do. They're not going to submit themselves to God. In spite of, you could look at Israel, and you look at all of the history. What had God done for them when he brought them out of captivity? Wonderful thing, wasn't it? They had been crying for that for years, decades, centuries, a couple of centuries. God did it for them. Uh, and he did it with a very powerful hand, didn't he? They get to the Red Sea, what happens? It opens up for them so they can pass through on dry ground. When the Egyptians start to follow, up, uh, follow them, water comes over and destroys them. Get out into the wilderness, they murmur about water, not having water. What does God do? Provides water for them on a couple of different occasions. They complain about not having food. What does God do? He provides manna. How many know what the, what the word manna means? Remember? <laughs> well, not what the substance is, what the word means. It means what is it? <laughs> They looked out, and they saw it, and they said, what is it? <laughs> well, that's what manna means. Uh, they, do, they cried out, we don't have any meat, so what does God do? He provides them quail. They get to the promised land, what does he do? He opens up Jordan River for them, pass over through dry ground. Go to, go to Jericho. What does he do? He delivers Jericho into their hand. How? By the military genius of walking around the city. A total of 13 times in seven days. Uh, and blowing horns and shouting a great shout. Military genius, right. Uh, then they start a southern campaign, then finally a northern campaign to take the whole land. Look at all that God had done for them. And what do they do? They forget about it. Uh, they didn't take those cities and take that land by their own power and their own might. They did it by God. And because they were being obedient to him. But now then, you've got a situation where they ignore all of that and say, we want Egypt's help. So in verse 2, he says, Yet he also is wise and will bring evil and will not call back his words, but will rise against the house of the evildoers and against the help of them that work iniquity. The Egyptian priest were famed for their wisdom. In Acts, the seventh chapter, Stephen is before the Sanhedrin and he's going through Israel's history. And he makes mention about Moses in this history and he says, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. 
the wisdom of the Egyptians. That's Acts 7 and verse 22. Um, they were known for that. That was one of their, I mean, Egypt was known for a lot of things, but that was, their wisdom was obviously well known to people. Um, also have the human counselors who followed Judah's wisdom. If you look at Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 14, it says, Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the, the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. So you had that wisdom of Judah as well. They're wise men, the men of understanding, or, the, or prudent men. So you had all of that wisdom, human wisdom. But if you look at chapter 19 and verse 11, surely the princes of Zoan are fools. The counsel of the wise counselors of Pharaoh is become brutish. How say ye unto Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise and the son of an ancient kings. All of this wisdom of the priest of Pharaoh, of the Egyptians, the wisdom of Judah, they all became fools before God. The, the world looks at wisdom far differently than what God does. The world says there is no God. God says the one who says that is a fool. Uh, <coughs> That's Psalm 14, verse 1, along with Psalm 53 and verse 1. Those two psalms basically or essentially say exactly the same thing. Uh, the evidence for God is overwhelming. We know that God exists. People refuse to accept it. Why? It goes back to what we were talking about. They want to do their own thing. They want to live their life in the way in which they want to live. And if they accept God, well, guess what? God has a standard of morality. And if they accept God, they're going to have to accept that standard of morality. They don't want that morality. So they would rather be a fool and say there is no God. But yet, look at the wise men of our society. How many of them believe in God? How many acknowledge His way? Very, very few of them. So, a lot of them will give lip service to it, but there's a lot of difference in giving lip service and actually accepting it. Uh, a lot of politicians will give lip service to something because they want your vote and not because they believe it. And after they get in office, they'll be totally different. Uh, what? They will act like they're religious. Uh, they'll... Well, we're not talking about those who mock it. We're talking right now about those who claim to accept it. For 
a lot of times political purposes, but in reality they don't. Um, but Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was Machiavelli's uh, book was titled? Uh, was it just simply the Prince? I thought it. I knew Prince was there, but I couldn't remember. I thought there was something else, <laughs> but just the Prince. Okay. Um, If they haven't memorized it, they at least live by it. Uh, they go out and do their surveys, and whatever the survey says, that's what they are going to say in order to get elected, and that's totally different. Uh, there's been several who have been caught who did that very thing in relationship to the subject of abortion. They knew that the people did not want abortion. Uh, so they would land on, we're pro-life, anti-abortion. They get in the office, they do the exact opposite. Uh, but there is so much rejection of God in our society. Uh, and what the psalmist says, or David says, the fool says there is no God. Um, however, all, with all of this wisdom, they did not consult God, which is what they should have done. In Numbers 27, and verse 21. Numbers 27 and verse 21, Moses says, And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim and before the Lord. At, at his word shall they go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. Go to the priest. Eliezer would have been the high priest. And you ask counsel of God. You could ask by him and uh, the Urim would show and would indicate what they should do. And he says, you go in, according to what God says, you come out. Uh, you do it, everything by God's instructions. Oh, that we would learn that today, isn't it? So they could have, they had an avenue by which they could ask specifically to God, what should we do? And God would tell them specifically about a specific situation, this is what you do. Hadn't Isaiah and the other prophets done exactly that, though? And they rejected that. They should have learned. Go back to Joshua. It's time. They have gone in, they've conquered Jericho, they lost at Ai, and then they had to go back to Ai, and they defeated Ai, and all of a sudden, in the ninth chapter, they have some visitors. And these visitors come to them and say, we want to make a treaty with you. They had dressed up as with old, tattered clothes. Their shoes were worn out. They got moldy bread and uh, food. And they said, see, we're from a far country. Look at our clothes. Look at our shoes. Look at our food. We're from a far country. Let's make a, a treaty. And notice verse 14. 
of Joshua 9, that the men took their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. After they made the treaty, they then learned these people live among us. And the people were upset at the leaders for making the treaty. And the leaders were, well, we made the treaty, we have to honor it. So they made them servants. But they made a huge mistake, and they realized after the fact, because they simply did not ask the counsel of God. Uh, now then, the people of Isaiah's day not only did not want to ask counsel of God, they were hearing God's word, and they said, we don't want to hear it. They shut their ears to it and said, we don't want the prophets to prophesy the truth on, the, on these matters. Get out of here. Leave us alone. Because they wanted to go to Egypt. They should have asked counsel of God. They failed to learn from history, and that's what Dale was saying. Well, we're doomed to repeat it. History goes over and over. It's just a repetition so many times of what has happened before. And that's what is taking place here. But thus, because of this, God is going to bring evil upon his people. Now then, let's take a step back for a minute, because if we, our initial thought when we see the idea evil, he will, that God will bring evil, and that's speaking about his people. He's going to bring evil upon his people. We think evil in relationship to sin. That's not always what it means, though. Here it's talking about evil in the sense of calamity. Um, some disaster. That's the idea of evil. It's not moral evil or sin that he's talking about. He's not saying that God is going to bring moral evil or he's going to bring sin upon the people. He's saying he's going to bring a calamity. He's going to bring a disaster upon them. Uh, and with God it says... He will not call back his words. He's not going to retract them. He's not going to turn around and say, well, I've changed my mind. Um, and specifically regarding their punishment. Uh, look at Numbers 23 and verse 19. Numbers 23, 19 says that God is not man that he should lie, neither the Son of Man that he should repent. He hath said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? God said it. He's going to carry it out. Uh, he doesn't need to retract his words. Since they had become evildoers, that is, the Israelites, and in particular in seeking help from Egypt and not seeking help from God, going after man's counsel instead of God's counsel, they're going to be destroyed, and anyone who helps them will be destroyed. Uh, he's going to rise against those evildoers and against those that help them. So those who help them, those who give them aid. Uh, a lot of times we kind of overlook those who help them. But God's not. Uh, 
primarily, of course, the discussion here is of Egypt. He's going to destroy Egypt as well. That's the one who would help them. Uh, but God considers those who help as culpable as those who do. Uh, what does anyone remember Ephesians 5 and verse 11? All good, evil, and evil good. No, that's not Ephesians 5 11. Okay, have no fellowship with them. Is it just the workers of darkness, or it's, is it also those who would fellowship them? Remember what 2 John 9, 3, 11 teaches? Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If any come unto you and bring not this doctrine... Receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. Why? For he that biddeth him God speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. Uh, remember Romans, the first chapter after Paul has listed all of these, this wickedness and sin. And he said in verse 18 that the wrath of God is coming upon all of these individuals. Remember what he says in verse 32, the last verse? and those who have pleasure in them that do them. Now, all of those things that we're talking about is people who would help, though, people who would fellowship or give aid to those who are doing evil. And God said, you're just as responsible as the evildoer himself. And so, here, God's going to punish not only the evildoer, but he's going to punish also them that help them because you're just as culpable or you're just as responsible in your helping of those individuals. Well, Andrew's about to ring the second bell, so we'll stop at this point, and then next week, Lord willing, we'll start in verse 3.